Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Today, we're continuing with episode two of season two of the Tom Petty Project podcast. I am your host, Kevin Brown. If you're tuning into the podcast for the first time, this is an album-by-album, song-by-song review of Tom Petty's entire catalogue with The Heartbreakers, Solo Records, and Mud Crutch. I'm also chatting to special guests, some of whom are connected directly to Tom and or the bands he's played with, and some of whom are fans like me, who just love talking about the man and his music. If my calculations are correct, covering the album songs and chatting to a couple of guests per season will take us up to the middle of 2026, at which point we'll start getting into B-sides, studio outtakes, live stuff, and any other songs I haven't covered that I think probably should get an episode. Um, All the rest from the Wildflowers release uh, will likely be a season all of its own. So that's what the podcast is uh, and where it's heading. But today we're listening to and talking about the self-titled second track from the album, You're Gonna Get It. As always, there's a link in the episode notes for you to go and listen, as we don't play the song in the episodes due to uh, licensing and usage rights. So go listen to that uh, from the notes. And then once you've done that, come back and we'll dig into it. Once John Scott had successfully got that first Heartbreakers record played on the radio, the band was itching to add some new material to the set list and had been playing an early version of Listen to Her Heart since April of 77. To that end, uh, Tom says that this album was written and recorded quite quickly so that they could head back out on the road with a a bigger set of original songs to choose from, uh, as well as some of the cover versions that they would do regularly. Tom wrote You're Gonna Get It on the piano and actually played the piano part on this track. The band brought in a string quartet to play the string parts and doubled it with the ARP synthesizer that Benmont plays. Even though Benmont wasn't a big fan of synths, he and the band really liked the ARP and thought it was really cool when it was routed through a Leslie speaker or a heavily phased effects unit. And we'll talk a little bit more about synths in a future season, but they were used sparingly on on those sort of first two or three albums. So after the hopefulness of When the Time Comes, which was last week's episode, You're Gonna Get It drops us into the darkness with one of Tom's snarling, angry betrayal songs. I don't want you no more, ain't gonna give you any more than you give to me, really set the tone immediately. The tenor of the song continues in a similar way with Go to somebody else like you do to me. Um, I can't crawl any further, you never crawl for me. You know, these lines that sort of set this, this antagonistic tone to the song. The chorus is really quite ominous, and what exactly the antagonist is going to get is never really established or resolved. It's merely implied. The insinuation is, though, that they're going to get their payback in one form or another, despite the fact that they look so good. In this way, it's quite similar to Fooled Again from the debut album. We find Tom in no mood to be messed around or toyed with. Vocally, it's also similar to Fooled Again in that Tom attacks it with that clipped, aggressive delivery through the verses before making it all the more menacing by filing off all the rough edges and lazily drawling his way through the choruses. Structurally, it's a fairly straightforward song until we get to that middle section, which is a solo and then a bridge, which is centered around drums and keyboards with the guitars really taking a back seat. And somewhat unusually for an early Heartbreakers song, this middle section after that last chorus and before the outro is 20 bars and clocks in at over 40 seconds. It's quite long for a Heartbreakers bridge on those early cuts and represents almost a quarter of a three minute song. So after a wonderfully bluesy eight bar Mike Campbell solo, we get a quite flat drone sort of style um, bridge for 12 bars, which is centered around Stan's toms and the interplay of the harp and the piano. And then there's also what sounds like an acoustic guitar mixed fairly low on the right channel. And then sort of near the end of that uh, that section, we get a heavily phased guitar coming in for those last four bars. And it almost has like a almost like an alien quality to, to, to the song as it leads back out into that outro. Now, incidentally, if you listen to the song Second Home by the Sea by Genesis, don't know if we have any Genesis fans listening to the podcast, you'll hear a real resemblance to that Tom pattern that Stan is playing through that bridge section. And it's been bugging me all week which song that pattern reminded me of. And it finally came to me when I sat down to write this week's episode. As sometimes it happens where you just think, oh, it's that song. Went and double-checked on YouTube. Yeah, that's exactly the one I was thinking of. Um, And I suspect that it's just a coincidence, really, rather than a straight lift by Phil Collins, as he's not a musician who really needs to steal licks. But it would be interesting to find out if he'd heard the song and either sort of just subconsciously brought that into in, into Second Home by the Sea, or maybe played it in, sort of in homage to Stan's drum part. 
If I ever speak to Phil Collins on the podcast, which is massively unlikely, I'll make sure I ask him. So, talking about Stan and his drums, this is one of my favorite drum parts from this album, maybe even from the first two or three albums. It's another really clever, subdued, well-written performance, just building the suspense through that first verse before we get the payoff that, of that opening line of the chorus. And the floor tom on the two-and, okay, I should explain, for the non-drummers, two-and is the beat between the second and third beats in a bar. So you count one and two and three and four and. So that and is where the tom comes in. Uh, you'll get the idea anyway if you think about it that way. So the floor tom is recorded and mixed beautifully and really sings. You can clearly hear its sort of melodic decay. So that mm, noise that you sort of hear when a, a to, after a tom's hit, um, which it, on the very first listen, when I wasn't under headphones, I actually thought it might be Ron sort of sliding off his bass note a little bit because you sometimes get that with those with those really sort of resonant uh, musical toms. Um, through the first chorus, he just sits on that ride cymbal with the kick and splash combo on the ones before filling into the second verse where we get a fairly straightforward kick snare pattern. In the second chorus, he adds in some side stick to complement the ride. His work through the solo and the outro is basically the same pattern as the second verse before the outro switches to using the snare to keep that four on the floor time with the kick dropping in with the bass around it. Another meticulously planned drum part from Stan. The song generally is quite bass heavy rather than treble uh, and again is focused around that rhythm section along with the piano and strings rather than being a, a really guitar forward song. Ron adds in a little variety to the simple pattern he's playing by creeping up an octave and then another octave to be playing you know quite a high part especially in parts of the chorus and as Stan rips into that snare one two three four pattern in the outro Ron adds a neat little part in where he's not He's not playing sort of, he's merely playing on the offbeat and dropping a note out in the couplet so that it, it really sort of accentuates that snare hit where the note, the bass note is missing. And as we say of the Heartbreakers regularly, the notes that they don't play are often the ones that really make the song work so well. You know, having that sort of subtle appreciation for arrangement so early in their recording career always impresses me. And Ron is a master exponent of knowing when to add a fill or a lick and when to most of the time, just sit in the pocket and be the rock that the rest of the song is built around. This song is no exception. It's time of that show where you test your knowledge of Tom's work as I throw some petty trivia your way. Last week, I asked you which song from Full Moon Fever was the most frequent show opener on the Strange Behaviour Tour? The answer, maybe somewhat surprisingly, is Love is a Long Road, which was only one of two songs from 1999's you know, first solo effort that was co-written with Mike Campbell. Even though it wasn't the show opener for the majority of the tour, it was still the most frequent one used uh, to lead off a gig. This week's question should be relatively straightforward for y'all, um, and it is this. What is the name of the first single that Tom ever recorded with Mudcrutch in 1975? Okay, let's get back to the song. Like the first song on the album, You're Gonna Get It isn't guitar driven, but the minimalist approach that Mike takes, and I assume there's only Mike's guitar part on this one as I, I don't hear a second guitar part on the studio recording, but it adds exactly what the song needs without muddying the sort of the stark brooding atmosphere of it. And we do still get that killer bluesy solo in the middle eight that has so much more impact because of the dearth of guitars through the rest of the song. And the guitars in the outro switch between panned hard left and hard right. And again, it's that, um, you know, that, that studio craft that the, the boys were getting used to in those early days um, really come, comes to the fore there. And again, you have to listen to this one in the headphones. Ben Mont has very little to do on this song in terms of keyboards, and we don't really hear him on the organ until the lead out from the second chorus, where he comes in with a sort of a simple three-step progression before adding in that high ARP synth part through the chorus, the bridge, and the outro. There's a great alternate take of this song on the American Treasure compilation, which I'll include in the episode links. The main differences are that Mike's guitar solo, for some reason, is mixed a little lower uh, the toms in the bridge are also mixed further into the right channel than on the original. Uh, Mike's phased guitar is also missing from the alternate version for whatever reason. And then on the original, um, there's, the song ends with a fade out that starts at about the two minutes, 40 seconds, but there's no fade out on the alternate take. Instead, the drums and the bass drop out and we're left with the strings, the arp and the vocals, and then just the strings. So I actually quite like the alternate version a little more as that ending, or certainly that part of the alternative version, as that ending gives the track sort of, 
more closure in a way and it feels sort of more complete to me so that's some really nerdy stuff there i guess but i do enjoy listening to alternate takes as they sometimes show you the evolution of the arrangement of a song and sometimes even the lyrics one thing i'd love to know about that version though is whether it's an actual take from 78 or if it was remixed from the masters when american treasure was being put together you should also check out the live version from the old grey whistle test uh, from 1978 which I think I posted, yes, I did. I posted yesterday to my social media channels. Um, I'll also put a link to that uh, in the episode notes. Okay, folks, that's a wrap uh, for this episode. And all that remains is my rating. As I say, the drum part in this song is one of my favorites on the album for sure. Uh, And as a hobbyist drummer myself, it's the one that I really enjoy paying close attention to for this episode. I promise I'll try not to bore you senseless with the drum nerd stuff too often, but this one is just too cool not to focus in on. Uh, I'm going to give You're Going to Get It uh, a 7 out of 10. It's really simple, really effective, and a really darkly atmospheric song that I really enjoy listening to and I think is a a great second track on the album. I do think the ending again on that alternate version is the way it should have been released, though, and it's another song that the band took to a different level live. Just go listen to that ripping solo that Mike plays on the Whistle Test version uh, and then the way that they end that one, too. Very rock and roll. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at The Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project. So follow, like, and subscribe as applicable. And again, please leave a review and or a rating if you haven't already done that. Last thing for today, uh, I just wanted to let you guys know, guys and girls and anything in between, sorry, I should say, um, that I have a really cool guest confirmed for our mid-season chat. And I'll be talking to them on December 15th. So I'll let you know more about that once those eggs have actually hatched. So as always, until we meet again next week, keep listening to and sharing Tom's music. Try to be kind. Try to say I love you to someone at least once a day. Stay safe and healthy. And I'll be back with you next week to talk about the third track on the album, Hurt. Bye-bye.